Go with me to Genesis 1.1. Father, thank you for the anointing. Thank you that you're the Holy Spirit that's going to open up our understanding today and bring peace, healing, and unity into our hearts, our minds, and into the body of Christ. That we will not stand divided, but we'll stand together. We'll put our, lamp, our light on the lampstand of the church and shine for the whole world to see. For we're in this world, but we're not of this world, and we need your courage and your boldness to stand for what the Word of God says, Father. Thank you for me having the ability and courage, the mind of Christ, to preach and say what I need to say today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. In the beginning, God. Before he created you and me, before he created the heavens and the earth, before he created any angel, before he did anything, before the sun was in the sky, before the galaxies were thrown in the sky, God was already God. He was before all things and he will always be. And we need to recognize that no matter what you think, what you feel, what you want, that doesn't change the fact that God is God. And you're not God. Amen. And God doesn't change. Amen. And what he says is true. God does not lie. Amen. Amen. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He, he brought into existence time. So he's outside of time. You get this? So even before he created all this, there was God. Pretty amazing. Go to John chapter 1, verse 1. It almost says the same thing. In the beginning was the Word. Well, it says in the, in the beginning was God. Well, y'all know that the Word is God, right? You know that the Word and God is the same thing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. Now, He is we know he's talking about Jesus Christ now. Do you all know that Jesus Christ was before he was born of the Virgin Mary? Jesus was already with God. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit was always together. And we need to recognize that Jesus didn't come into existence whenever he was born. He came out of glory. He came from God and took upon himself a human body. And I want to ask y'all something, according to what's been going on in our world today. When did he take on that human body? At the conception. Come on, not at the birth, at the conception. He was in his body, in Mary's body. At the conception. Whose body was he in? His body. But was in her because she was the woman, the man with a womb that's going to bring forth life. Yes. Amen? Amen? So I don't want to get political with you, but I'm going to get biblical with you. Amen. Then you do what you got to do with it. Amen. But we got some great things, some things that are going on in our world today that the enemy is going to try to use to destroy, to kill, steal, and destroy. But we need to preach the word, stand on the word, stand on the truth, and do what the Bible says, regardless of what you think and what you feel. All I know is if I'm wrong, i got a God that will forgive me. Amen. And if you're wrong, there's a God that forgives you. Amen. If you've done wrong, there's a God that loves you and will forgive you Amen. and restore you. And if I do wrong, there's a God that loves me and will forgive me and restore me. Because he's about redeeming, he's about saving, he's not about condemning. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Amen. He didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. It's amazing that we can see all the way through the Bible, God doesn't hide the sins of the people that are in the Bible. He reveals them to us, but shows us that whenever they turn their hearts towards him, he's a forgiving, loving God. And even King David, after all what he did at the end of the story, he says, that's a man after my own heart Amen. who will do all my will. Amen. So th this is what we need to get a hold of. And, and, and John the Baptist 
in, in, in Luke chapter 1. Zechariah is in, in the temple and the angel comes to Zechariah and says, you're going to have a son. Your wife is going to conceive and his name will be called John. So God knew John before John was even conceived. Amen. Now y'all get this now. God knew John before John was even conceived. So for sure it was before he was born. God knew Jesus was going to be born. Gabriel pronounced it to Mary that you're going to conceive and his name will be called Jesus. Amen. The virgin's what? Going to conceive. And so, like I'm saying, let, let, let's get it straight. John the Baptist, whenever Elizabeth conceived him, John the Baptist was in his own body, in the body of his mother. Do you know how significant that is? If we're going to talk about we should have the right over our own body, then they should have the right over their own body too. Uh oh. It's not your body, it's his body. Whenever I was conceived, even though it was a little bitty thing, it was my body. And I'm here. Amen. And the thing is, when God created man and woman, he created man to have a seed and he created the woman to be the womb with the egg to conceive the seed. And he told, man, he told Adam, he said, he said, go and be fruitful and multiply. So the only way you can multiply is if you have seed. Amen? Amen. Amen. You, 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 can't multiply, you can't grow a garden if you don't have seed. You can't multiply nothing. You have to have seed to multiply. And you know, guys, this works in every area of your life. Finances is seed. Everything. You're loving somebody. What you give, you're going to get. What you sow, you're going to reap. Amen? Amen. But I, I want to have a baby. I got some seed, but I can't have a baby by myself. Right. I know some of y'all ladies wish you could, these us guys could have our own baby. <laughs> There's got to be a place to put the seed, to nurture the seed, to bring forth life. And that's what the woman part of the relationship is. Adam, before, I wonder what Adam really was like before God put him to sleep and took Eve out of him. Come on, let's, let's stretch our thinking a little bit now. He said, it's not good for you to be alone, Adam. So I'm going to make you a helper. He didn't go back to the ground, did he? He put him to sleep and he went into the man, into Adam, and took out of Adam Eve. He took out of the man, the woman, the 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 man with a womb so that for them to be able to bring increase it was going to take companionship and relationship and family and God was starting something that's tremendously amazing so ladies I want y'all to know something just because you're a woman doesn't mean you're not in the image and likeness of God you're just as much in the image and likeness of God because what was God like? He said, I made Adam in my own image and my own likeness. That was before he took Eve out. So when you really study and get into it, I'm not going to break it down too much. You can study yourself. In God, you're going to find the masculine and feminine nature in him, in, in himself. But he wasn't going to, and so he could, he could procreate within himself. But man wasn't going to be that way. Mankind, which Adam also, also is translated mankind. So he took the woman out. And what did Adam say? Ooh, look at that hair. Look at them hips. Look at them lips. No, he said, wow, that's flesh of my flesh, bone of my bone. She was going to be called woman because she was taken out of Adam, out of man. He said, that's me. That's part of me. But she's got a womb. Woman. And the two became one flesh. Amen. Amen. And they were naked and were not ashamed. Amen. And as soon as that happened, the next verse says, and the devil. Because yeah. the devil does not want that to happen. He does not want to see life come forth. Right, so 
Ladies, you all are designed. So there's something in you that wants to nurture and, and bring forth and conceive and bring forth life. But whatever seed you let come into your mind and into your life, that's what you're going to be reproducing. If you want to have death inside of you, death in your mind, you're going to be reproducing death. Oh, I'm getting a little quiet now. That's why it's such a desire for well, women. Most women, they, they have this desire to, to bring forth and, and to be a mother. And after you have one or two, you say, I don't know why I wanted all that. No, but just kidding. But you know what? Not everyone is designed to be married. I'm talking about this Wednesday night. This, this, whenever they have single groups in, the, in churches and whatever, they act like we got to come together so we can hook y'all up. We got to fix you up. Like being single means you need to be fixed. Whenever the Apostle Paul says being single is a gift from God. Now, is it a gift or not? So if, if, if you're okay within yourself to be single, don't let the church or the world, anybody else think it's like a curse to be single. It says in the Bible, it's a gift of his grace. Amen. But that single, single person thinks they need to be married and some married people think they need to be single. But why do we put this stigma on people that, that have the gift to be single? Like, well, you went through all your life and you never got married. What's wrong with you? Well, I had a gift from God. Amen. And I used my life to what? Glorify God, to serve God, to serve others. And, and it's a gift from God. Amen. So if you're going to be called to be single, guess what? You're not supposed to participate in sex. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that, amen. <laughs> but we want to teach differently than the Bible. If you're called to be single and you're single, you're supposed to keep yourself. And if you can't keep yourself because you burn, this is all in the Bible. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, okay, then you're supposed to go ahead and marry. So you're not just going to be tempted for your whole life. And then when you get married, amen, which biblical marriage is what? Between a man and a woman, Adam and Eve. Eve came out of the man. They became one flesh, able to procreate, fulfill the command of God to replenish the earth or to fill the earth. Amen. So once you get married, that means you quit dating other people. You're only supposed to have sex with the person you marry. Amen. And see, some of you say, oh, we got some kids in here. Kids need to learn it because they're going to learn it on the playground if you don't let them learn it in church or you don't teach them yourself. Amen. 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 So there's really only biblically one kind of sex, isn't there? Right. Holy sex. Right. If you're married with each other, right. if you have sex with somebody else, it's called immorality. Adultery. If you're not married, you're supposed to stay single. You're not supposed to be having sex with somebody else because if you are, it's called fornication, sexual immorality. It doesn't matter what your desires are. You've got to always rein your desires in because a married man still might want to look at a, another woman. And you've got to do what? Don't look. Once you see her, turn back. And, but you see, what happens is temptation. And so you look once and oh, let me look again. Uh-oh. And then you go follow them. Hey, wow. Mm. Uh-oh. Jesus said, if you lust after, you already sin. So, same with girls. Amen. Come on. So, I mean, this is pretty plain. But when we get outside of the realm of this holy sexuality... All kind of other stuff begins to get loose. Because most of all what we're dealing with is the fruit of sexual immorality. Amen. Amen. But once you have conceived, the person 
You can call it a fetus if you want, but the person that's in your womb, that's their body. And shouldn't they have autonomy over their own body too? That's why as a Christian, we believe what I, I believe what I believe. Okay, let's go to uh, Jeremiah. Go to chapter, I mean, verse 14 of chapter 1. I want you to see this. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word that was in the beginning came from the beginning into time, became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now let's go to Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah 1.4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, which is Jeremiah saying, before, say before, before, before I formed you in the womb. He says, what? I knew you. Now that's pretty doggone good, isn't it? Before I was even conceived in my mother's womb, before I was in my mother's womb, God knew me. Did I know God? I don't know. I don't remember. But God knew me. Amen. And he knew what I was going to be doing, where I was going to be born. He preordained a family I was going to be born in. He preordained a time. We can go to, uh, to the book of Acts in chapter 17. He knew where, when, who, all this. He knew. Amen. And you know why he knew me? Because he had a plan for me. That's right. So if he knew me, even before I was in my mother's womb, when he comes along in my life and he speaks to me, or he calls me, guess what happens? I can recognize his voice because I'm one of his. Those that are his recognize his voice. The reason you're sitting here today is because he knew you before you was even born, before you was even in your mother's womb. And, and he called you. And because he called you, you heard him. And now you responded to him. And he's got a plan for your life. Amen. This is no accident that you're sitting in here today. This is the ultimate power and magnificent love and uh, this omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent God that's doing a work that's beyond our little brains to comprehend. Amen. I'm going to show you this. I'm, 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 I'm not making this up. I know I'm getting myself in trouble with some people's things, but I'm going to show you what the Bible says. We're going to keep going. All right. He said, I knew you before you were born. I sanctified you and I ordained you. That means I set you apart and, and, and put my anointing. I called you, ordained you a prophet to the nation. Somebody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Before I was even in my mother's womb, before I, uh, my mom and dad even thought about me, God knew me. He knew I was going to preach the gospel. And hopefully... The souls that were saved, the people that were changed, the seed that I sowed, the seed that I watered, the nets that I threw for God to bring in to the kingdom of God is going to help fill up a little bit of heaven. Amen. Even if after maybe 10 years you don't like me very much. So what? I got you caught. I caught you. God used me to catch you. One watered, one planted, but God brought the increase. And to him is all the glory. Because he knew me before that. He, he ordained me. And, and just like he did with Jeremiah, listen to what he says. And then I said, Ha, huh, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak. I, used to, I told him, I can't do that. I can't, I can't even read. For I'm a youth. And the Lord said to me, Do not say I'm a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Don't be afraid of their faces. For I am the Lord, uh, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Wow. That's why when Paul in Ephesians 6, he says, pray for me that I have the boldness to say what God wants me to say. Because when you start looking at people, you're not going to say what you need to say. When you start worrying about what people, uh, I'm not here for you to like me. I'm here for you to learn what the word of God says. And then you're going to decide. Oh, well, listen. God's pro-choice. You get to choose if you're going to obey him or not. He's a gentleman. He's not going to make you obey him. 
And I'm going to love you no matter what decision you make because I know he's a redeeming, forgiving God. And you should love me no matter what I say because if I'm wrong, he's a redeeming, loving God. And he should be able to forgive me too. And you need to pray that God opens my eyes just like I'm praying that God will open your eyes. And we need to walk this thing again. But we're the body of Christ and they're the world. Amen. That may go on in the world, but it shouldn't go on in the body of Christ like that. And I'm going to be straight up with you. It's not about politics because parties, parties, whatever it is, the R or the D is still not the kingdom of God. You got to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Amen. Political parties are not based upon the kingdom. They're based upon men and, 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 and platforms and what, what the agendas are and all that. And some people have good agendas and some don't have so good agendas. So I'm not promoting any kind of political thing. I'm telling you what the Bible teaches. Hopefully you see that. I'm telling you exactly what it says. Go with me to the book of Romans. Chapter 8. Verse 29. For whom he, God, foreknew. He also predestined. He knew you beforehand and he's got a destiny for you that he's already planned. And it's to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, he, whom he predestined, these he also called. Oh, he knew me before. He pre-knew me. He, he, he predestined me and then he called me. And when he called me, I heard his voice. When he called you, did you hear his voice? And when you heard his voice, what happened? Faith rose up in your heart and you came alive because you know what? You didn't choose him. He chose you. Somebody say hallelujah that I got chosen. But you know, you can be sitting in here listening to me and you don't understand a word I'm saying because you can't hear his voice. He said the reason in one place in the book of John chapter 8, it says the reason you don't believe is because you can't hear my voice. You don't know the truth. Because you don't want to understand the truth. You don't want to hear the truth. Amen. So we're blinded and we're deaf to hearing what God is saying. Amen. But I want to be led by his spirit. Yes. So whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, when he called you, these he also justified. That justification is your salvation. That's what it is. Justification is being born again. It's becoming a child of God, having your name writ written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And who did it? He did it. You didn't write your own name in his book. You didn't die on the cross for your own sins. He did it all for you and me. And it started even before you was in the womb. So when did you become a person? When God decided you from the beginning of eternity. You know, actually, we come from eternity and we're going to go back to eternity. Isn't that pretty awesome? Since it's saying that we were known by him before we was even conceived. How many of you know it also says that Jesus Christ was crucified before the foundations of the world? So he knew there was going to be a problem. and had the solution to the problem before the problem. That's our God. That's who we worship. That's who we serve. That's why you can have confidence that you are a child of God and that when you die, you're going to spend eternity with him. Because he justifies you. But when he calls you, did you say yes? When he collared you, I can go collar you again. Don, when he grabbed a hold of you and got you, got, got up in your face, did you say yes? Or did you say, oh, no, I don't, I don't want none of that. I'm, I'm my own God. I sit in my temple. This is my body, my temple. I do what I want with it. I got... It's my temple. No, if you're a Christian, your body belongs to God. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you're only supposed to do with it what God says to do with it. Lord, help us, huh? Glory to God. 
Because we like to make these old bodies comfortable. I'm enjoying my air conditioning here. I'm not enjoying the one in my house so much because it don't want to turn off. It keeps running all the time. And then what does he say? Guys, listen to this. Whom he justified, these he also glorified. Y'all yes. know what that means? We're going to have a brand new body just like Jesus. Yes. We're going to have an immortal body, eternal body, incorruptible, no more tears, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, no more death. For all these former things are going to pass away. Behold, he says, I'm going to make all things new and I'm going to be glorified. Can you all imagine how good looking I'm going to be once I'm glorified? Amen. You too. You're going to be your perfect self. The way we judge according to the outward appearance, outward appearance in the world is not how God judges. I mean, did, did you see Mother Teresa when she got up in the age and she had a wrinkled face and holy woman of God? Do you know how beautiful of a holy woman she was as an elderly woman that had served God with all of her heart? See, every crack, every line, every bruise in her hand or cut, it was a sign of her serving her God. And there's nothing looks better on you than God. Amen. If you want to look good, get some more God on you. Amen. Amen. Now, 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 am, I, am I twisting this or is this what it's saying? Do, do, do you all see that God knew us before? God predestined us, gave us a destiny. God called us out of the world to fulfill that destiny. And then he said, then because that I'm going to justify you, I'm going to give you the ability to be filled with the Holy Spirit, be sanctified and filled with the Holy Spirit and become the, the tool and the person that, that you're called to be to represent me and fulfill your destiny. And you're going to be glorified and we're going to spend eternity together and we're going to celebrate what we've done. Hallelujah. Woo! Glory to God. But other people get caught up and not seeing that whenever they conceive that that is really a person. And that person, just like they want to have control over their body, wants to have autonomy over their body. But they can't because they're a baby. When a baby is born, the minute it's born, the baby cannot take care of itself. Amen. It's going to be totally relying upon that mother, basically, for the first three years. I love you, fathers, but God designed that mama to really, I mean, you can't nurse the baby. Sorry, Uncle Paul, can't do it. Because that's, that's how God made you. And guys, it's not the dude's fault. Amen. Take it up with God. Amen. But our world doesn't like some of this is what I'm talking about. Amen. But I'm not of the world. Amen. Amen. And I'm not trying to lessen the woman and exalt the man. Amen. In fact, what I'm saying today should exalt the woman and lessen the man. Amen. Adam's the only one that gave birth or had, a, had a, something come out of him. All the rest of them came from the women. And it actually says that in 1 Corinthians 11. The first man came out of woman, but every other man came. I mean, the first woman came out of man, but every other man came out of woman. Right. We need each other. Amen. And if we don't desire to, to bring forth life, then I don't think we have the desire that God's heart has. Amen. He's a God of life. It's amazing. Galatians chapter 1, verse 15. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. This is the Apostle Paul talking now. To reveal his son in me. Exactly what we just read. He wants us to be conformed to the image of his son. That I might preach him among the Gentiles. 
I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. So God calls him, chooses him. He doesn't go say, okay, let me find out if, if man will agree with this. He goes into the wilderness and spends 15 years getting himself right with God. Understanding who he was, what God had ordained for him to do. What God had predestined him to do, what his destiny was going to be. And he told him whenever he was converted, he said, you persecuted the church and you're going to suffer many things for my glory. I'm going to use you. And you can read about his suffering. When you're led by the spirit, that doesn't mean you're not going to suffer. Because he ordained some people to go through hard things. Amen. Let's read uh, Psalms 139, verse 13. For you have formed my inward parts. You have covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works that my soul knows very well. Listen, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret. Skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. That means he, was, he made him a masterpiece in the mother's womb. Lowest parts of the earth is the mother's womb in, this, in, in, in the Bible. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. He saw me before he formed me. And in your book, all they all were written, the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. In other words, he already has ordained my destiny and my days were already fashioned for me. He made me. He planned for me to do some things. He called me. I have to respond to that calling because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He knew my days even before I was yet formed. He says, how precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more than the number of, than sand, more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. His thoughts toward, y'all know there's a lot of sand. My goodness. You ever been to the beach? I mean, even on the Red River, they got sand. And it says his thoughts towards me are more than the sand. More than the stars in another place. He thinks about us all the time. He loves us. He knows us. Isn't that awesome? I'm going to go to Judges chapter 6. And we're going to just talk a little bit about that. And then we're going to have communion. Judges chapter 6. Verse 11. This is about Gideon. How many of y'all ever heard about Gideon? Thank God that Gideon received his calling. Thank God that he was destined to do something great. Amen. And when God gets involved, when God is doing something, it's pretty amazing. Look at verse 11. It says, Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the therabone tree, which, is, which was an arpha, which belonged to Joaz, the Aberzite. Hallelujah. Y'all say he did it. While his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. So Gideon is hiding and he, 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 he's threshing wheat where the enemy cannot find him. Y'all got the picture here? And the angel appears to him and in there and he says, And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Well, he's hiding in the dark, but God says, No, you're not a hidden man. You're a mighty man of valor. See, the world might say something about you. You might say something about yourself, but God has a plan for you that's greater than you. 
You know what my name means? Mark, you know what the word Mark means? Mighty warrior. Kind of the same thing. Mighty man of valor, mighty warrior. I don't feel like no mighty warrior. But the battle belongs to the Lord. And my last name is Crawford, which means river crosser. So I'm a mighty warrior that crosses rivers. I guess I got to cross a river somewhere. So you even know what your name is? You know what your destiny might be? And Gideon said to him, O Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all these, this happened to us? And were, or, or all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go in this mighty, uh, go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? So says, go in this might of yours. He doesn't feel mighty. And he's going to tell us that. But when God says you've got some might, you've got might. Because God called him, God ordained him, God knew him. Amen. So no matter what's going on in your life, listen to what God says about you instead of what you say about yourself. I don't know where you're at. You might feel like everything is going wrong, but God wants to deliver them. So go in this mind of yours. Okay, verse 15. And he said to him, O Lord my God, how can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my father's house. Well, he doesn't have a good opinion of himself, huh? God said, go, Mark, go, you can do it. Oh, no, not me, I can't read. Remember Moses? I'm not an eloquent speaker. We always got our excuses about why not to go. If God says go, get up and go. Because he'll go with you. Because if, if you think it's you doing it, you're putting your trust in the wrong person. Amen. Whatever God says you can do, you can do it. Just because he said it. He said, I'm the least in my father's house. And the Lord said to him, surely I will be with you and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talked with me. Do not depart from here, I pray, until I come to you and bring my offering and set it before you. And he said, this is God said, I will wait until you come back. Now that's pretty. So somebody, he said, I'm going to go get an offering now and I'm going to bring it back to offer to you. I want to make sure that I'm hearing from God. Now, you know, the rest of the story puts a fleece out. And then, you know, the fleece is wet and, and the uh, ground is dry. Then the next thing he says, OK, I've got to do it again. We're going to try the next time. Then it says the ground is wet and the fleece is dry. So he, he gives him two supernatural signs so that he can confirm. He says, yeah, the, I think now it, it was the angel of the Lord. So God did everything he could to prove to, to Gideon that what he said was true and that he was able to do what he called him to do. And with 300 men, he wiped out all of the Midianites. Amen. Men that were ready to follow him by getting on their, their hands and knees and drinking water to prove that they could be part of his army. It's an awesome story to read. But we get in the same position. I'm nobody. I come from nowhere. I can't do nothing. But if God says you can do it, it's time to stand up and do what God's called you to do. Because he knew you when? Before you were even in your mother's womb. He foreknew you and predestined you and ordained you, had a call on, on, on your life. And so what? He calls you and you should have answered. And you already answered. If you're born again, you've answered. If you've not been born again, you need to give your life to Jesus Christ today and begin to say yes to the call of God on your life. Because you're not here by accident. Amen. You're here to hear this, this message because... He planned for you to be here today. 
He ordered this day for you. That's what it says. And then what does he do? He justifies you. And then he'll glorify you. What a promise from God. So my point here is, no matter what the world says, life begins even before a person gets pregnant with God. God knows us before. By name. Has a plan for our lives. Predestines us. Has a plan to ordain us. To call us out. Because guys, everyone in this room is going to die. We're passing through. And the goal is to preach the gospel of salvation and eternal life to a whole world that is turning their back on God right now. It's supposed well, you're being mean. No, I'm going to love them. I love every person. Like I said, just like me, I mess up. And if, if, I'm, if I'm messing up right now, I want God to show me and I'm going to ask for his forgiveness. But I want to lead you to the forgiving God. On the cross, he said, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Amen. But once you know what you're doing and you rebel against God, then that's going to be between you and God. And honestly, I, I, I care about your soul. But if you want to choose to do what you want to choose to do, you can just do it. Just don't let it affect me. And the ones I love. But I'm going to speak the truth in love. I'm going to have my door always open to you. I'm going to try to give you the answers that you need. When you're hurting because you have found yourself in a place of sin or, or, or devastation or whatever, we want to lift you up, not kick you because you're down. Amen. Amen. When a man messes up or a woman messes up and they commit adultery and fidelity, there still is healing and there's still restoration. When, when a, a couple goes through a divorce, there is still healing and there's still restoration. The cross is greater than all of these things. If somebody goes through an abortion, there is still forgiveness and there's still restoration. Don't try to explain it away so you can feel good about it if the Holy Spirit is convicting you about it. There's always healing. If you, if you have taken a man's life or a woman's life, Moses took a life. Paul, the apostle Paul, took a life. King David took a life. And they found the grace and the mercy of God. And he created in them a clean heart. He, he took the hardness of their heart away and gave them forgiveness. So if God can forgive those things, he can forgive anything. There's only one sin he won't forgive. When you reject his sacrifice of the cross. Because he's reaching out with you with a perfect love. He's demonstrating his love to you by dying on the cross for the whole world. And we say, I don't want you. I don't need it. Well, then guess what? You're going to stand before God and you're going to have to answer for your sins. And there will not be any redemption for you. Because you rejected the blood. You rejected the sacrifice. You rejected the lamb that was for you. You rejected his demonstration of love. Amen. And the Holy Spirit is always drawing you to a place of humility and accepting it. That's why it's called blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is the one that reveals God to you. You didn't get saved without the Holy Spirit. You didn't get convicted in your heart without the Holy Spirit. You didn't, nothing happened in your life without the Holy Spirit. But you're going to say, I ain't going to let the Spirit of God lead me. I don't need you. But any other thing, there ain't no sin you commit that the cross can't take care of. And if you said no to him, all you got to do is repent of that and he'll take care of you there too. That's why when I mess up and he convicts me, I run to the cross. I run to the blood. I confess my sin. I agree with God about what he says about my sin. And he's faithful and just to forgive my sin and to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. 